Hello and welcome back to the Old School MMA Review. I am the Fight Nerd and joining me on the other side of the screen is Zane Simon from BloodyElbow.com. Zane, what's going on? Ah, not a lot. I just watched Choke, the documentary centered around Valley Tudo Japan in 1995. Yes, as did I, conveniently. I guess that means we should talk about it on air. Yeah, I think that's something that we should totally do, man. Totes my goats. Indeed. So anyway, we're here to talk about Valley Tudo Japan 1995 and yes. <laughs> documentary Choke centered around the event. Precisely. That's right. We're taking a break from uh, con- reviewing further UFCs for the moment as we begin collecting votes for our old school MMA award show. And if you guys haven't voted yet, you're a disappointment to me and Zane. You should either go vote or kill yourself, one of the two. Well, I, it's been a while since I've committed ritual seppuku, so uh, now is as good a time as any. <laughs> <laughs> Democracy fails again. <laughs> uh. Yeah, our awards are going on. You guys should be voting if you haven't already. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about Choke, as we said. Uh, Choke uh, is a documentary that was shot in 1995 that focuses around the Valley Tudo Japan Open Tournament. Uh, and the documentary didn't actually even get any distribution until four years later in 1999 when it was distributed through, of all people, Manga Entertainment. Uh, yeah. And as the name implies, that was a company that basically dealt in anime. Uh, you know, they, they were the ones... In fact, I think the first way I even heard about this documentary was by watching probably some anime tape. Uh, and I saw that as like one of the trailers for Choke. And I was like, huh, that's kind of cool. Um, so the film is directed and produced by Robert Goodman. He has not done much else, uh, at least according to IMDb, since Choke. He's done another documentary called 180 Degrees to Jerusalem. And he p- produced a short film, I believe, uh, called Cross Bronx. So, you know, he he's, hasn't gotten too much luck, I guess, maybe with distribution or whatever's going on with it. But uh, Choke was the first documentary that got him any recognition. And uh, it's pretty good doc. I mean, I guess we're going to yeah. we'll talk about our, our overall impressions. But, yeah, I mean, that that's basically the background of the thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, and... I would say it's probably, it's probably a better way to watch Valley Tudo Japan 1995 than just sitting down and watching Valley Tudo Japan 1995. I would agree with that. I, I would agree with that, and uh, I actually tried to find the entire event, uh, but I couldn't really find anything other than really, uh, you know, the stuff that's on this documentary and like one or two other things here and there. But for the most part, I had a hard time finding any fights uh, from from '95 of this event. Yeah, and which is 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 weird because I'm sure that the event video exists somewhere. The Japanese were pretty good. I mean, there's even like old Shudo S Cup like modified kickboxing events online out there from like the 80s so I'm sure that the video of Valley Tudo Japan exists but it just hasn't made its way uh, across the pond and that's kind of too bad because or across the Pacific rather um, because it's actually you know a pretty important event in the history of MMA at least in terms of how important any of these events are yeah and more so for Japan too because you know this is now the reason we're kind of we chose this one over other things to watch in between is because this actually does kind of bridge the gap as to what's happening internationally and also answers a few other questions we had, uh, namely in particular the ever important question of why the hell was Hicks and Gracie never in the UFC? And folks, your answer is choke the documentary. Uh, you know, as we talked about in the past and uh, in my interviews with Art Davey, we also talked about this. Hickson was never in the UFC mainly because of money, and uh, he essentially said he could make a ton more money fighting one fight in Japan than he would in the UFC. Um, yeah. So you know, and obviously, Art Davey was trying to get him for UFC one for any UFCs past that, but things never worked out. And that's because basically, after UFC one, Japan started their own uh, Ultimate Fighting Championship style tournament, which was the first uh, Valley Tudo Japan Open 1994. Which surprise, surprise, Hicks and Gracie won that as well. Uh, so it makes sense, of course, to do the sequel, uh, and that's what this documentary covers. So we'll, we'll give some more information on on the tournaments as we go along. But uh, yeah, this. I guess let's just start with our overall impressions. Uh, Zane, as a whole, as a movie, uh, what did you think about Choke? It's, I mean, it, it's interesting in that, like, I think, I think I came into it with the idea that it was branded as a Hicks and Gracie documentary. Um, and that's certainly the first feeling you get out of it is this focus on Hickson. And he's certainly the biggest, you know, he's the most covered athlete in the documentary. But it would really, I think, play a lot better if it were, if I, you know, come into it thinking of it as a Valley Tudo Japan documentary. That's really what it feels like. And ultimately, 
as a as a documentary of the event, it's pretty solid. It's a little unfocused, and it probably picked the least interesting story out of that event. But it's still it's a fun way to look back at the a big MMA event. Yeah, to me, I guess I kind of see the opposite side, where it just feels like a Hicks and Gracie documentary with then a large lump suddenly about uh, you know Valley to Japan, even though there are other cast members in it. Hickson gets easily like you know, I don't I don't want to say two thirds as a ratio, but there's a, a lot of it is about him more than anybody else. It's, it's he is the star, uh, despite other actors or not actors, despite other people being documented in this, um, which is weird. Well, I guess that's something we can definitely talk about a little bit later on. But um, but was this your first time actually watching Choke? Yes, yes, I hadn't seen it before. Okay, uh, yeah, this was I, I don't know how many times I've seen it now, but I know it's easily one of the first I've ever seen uh, for MMA documentaries, and it was I think one of my articles on Bloody Elbow as well, uh, a review of this thing. So I've seen it a bunch of times, but it's been a, at least a year since I've seen it. Uh, and I've always enjoyed it to an extent, but it's not, it's definitely not a perfect documentary uh, by any means. So No. Yeah. So I guess let's just jump in. We can kind of discuss, I guess, first things first, is who our, our cast of characters is. And obviously, Hicks and Gracie is the star of this doc. Yeah. It, it's mostly about Hicks and, and I actually love that it starts right off the bat. And remember, this is all in 1995 that it starts right off the bat. With Helio Gracie basically saying, Hickson Gracie is the champion of our family. Yeah, and he remember says all this, his sons are unbeaten, and, and he says, I actually have that quote written down, he says all of his sons are invincible. Yeah, all of his sons are invincible, all you know, and all that. But he starts it out with, Hickson Gracie is, our, is like the champion of the Gracie family. You know, he, he's our best fighter. And remember, this is like a year... After two years after Hoist Gracie won UFC one and two and has been like you know the big deal for the American side of martial arts and the birth of it there and even still it's very clear that Hoist is not not at the top of the pecking order even in his own family. Which actually brings up another good point, um, which is something that kind of bothered me in that they didn't really talk much about the other Gracies. Um, we, we, we actually don't get formally introduced to Hoyler, who appears throughout the movie, until at least 40 minutes, if not more, into the film. Like, we finally get a real introduction to who this guy is that we've been seeing next to Hickson for the last, you know, Yeah, it, it's, hour. it's an hour, I think, in. That they're like, here's his, you know, Hoyler, Gracie, is incredibly important to Hickson's camp. Yeah, for something, cause, and that's why I think the, the lack of focus comes in, because for something that's very focused on Hickson, Gracie, around Valley Tudo, Japan, it's not very focused on... On Hicks and Gracie as a person, I'd say that in general for all the uh, for all the cast, with the exception of Kimura, who we'll talk about in a second too, uh, is it really just was jumbled about. Uh, Hickson was the focus, but even then, as the focus, you know, I don't really think they did a great job explaining much about the family's lineage. I mean, they mentioned the history no. of BJJ, but in terms of the lineage, how important they are, um, not much at all. I mean, we we, met, we meet Helio early on, and he talks like an old man rambling, which is great. But we don't really get introduced formally to Hoyler. There's no mention of Hoist at all. Uh, I guess at this point, maybe that they, they weren't really uh, that close together. That might be what the case was. They might have not been as close at this point. Uh, I think that there may have been a falling out that had to happen by this point. So that could be why they didn't really mention Hoist. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's funny, too, because it makes it it's interesting in that it makes it very much a documentary for MMA fans to go back and watch. Because you really have to have a lot of surrounding knowledge to make a lot of sense of this. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the one of the weaknesses of this documentary as a whole is that it never really explains very well what MMA is. Never really explains any any history. Uh, you know, I was surprised there was not really any mention of the word UFC. You can't do an MMA documentary in 2014 without using the words UFC. It's pretty much nearly impossible. But back then, I mean, they got away with it, and there was not even one mention of it. And I guess at at the time, it doesn't matter. Nowadays, we're like, how can they even do that? Yeah, it's in, well, it's just interesting in, in sort of in. Like I say, in the lens of this idea of building Hickson and talking about Hickson, that, like I say, there's no, men you know, it's sort of like he's the one doing this. He's the one. He's the only one out there fighting. Is almost the the lens you're given here, you know, like they're a family of fighters and they're all great and unbeatable. But Hickson's the big champion fighting the important bouts and. In the in the eventual lens of MMA, Hickson's MMA career is almost entirely unnotable. Yeah, that's something we can definitely talk about by the time we get to the fights as well. There's a lot we can actually cover with this movie, and in terms of 
history that we never got to talk about on the other Old School MMA Awards, just because... Uh, old school MMA videos. I plugged the award show again. Uh, on the other videos, just because you know we we never had Hickson fight in any of the UFCs, so we never had a chance to actually talk about the dude. Um, but besides Hickson, I mean, the documentary also does follow around uh, a few other fighters. We have uh, Todd Hayes, who is a kickboxer who's training out of uh, I believe it's Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma. Um, yep. Former football player, K1 fighter as well. Uh, pretty in shape dude, and so we we get to meet him and his manager Dale Apollo Cook, who's another uh, pretty well known. Uh, kickboxing champion who retired and then began coaching a lot of other K1 fighters. Uh, so that's our other American aspect. And then over in Japan, we have uh, Koichiro Kimura, who uh, was a judo guy, wrestling guy, uh, also a pro wrestling guy. Um, yeah. At this point, his lineage wasn't really very set, and he was he had never actually even had fought a real fall on no rules match before. So this event was basically his debut. Uh, and then later on, we do get to meet a few other fighters, but we'll talk about them, I guess, once we get to the actual tournament itself. And we don't really meet them so much as we just sort of, like, get a few shots of them here and there. Like, there's no real surrounding story given to them, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, for the most part, we get little vignettes. That's actually what this is more so. Yeah. Uh, and that's really one of, the, one of the interesting things about the documentary that I don't know if it works or doesn't work. I haven't really decided yet, uh, is that we don't really get much of biographies of any of these guys. We get vignettes about things they do. Uh, so we never really ever crack the surface other than of uh, fighting. And that's, you know, I mean... It, in this case, the documentary, it's more about fighting itself, it seems like, and less about yeah. who these people are. There's very little personal stories to them. Which is why, I, I mean, that's why I think it works great if you're already an MMA fan. It's really kind of like a little nice historical image of fighting at the time rather than something that really is going to build build a sense of MMA for somebody who has no idea of it. Yeah, I think we could say pretty fairly that Choke is essentially a snapshot of MMA in 1995. Yeah, that's very much what it feels like. It feels, you're watching it, you're like, oh man, this is exact, like this This gives you the perfect sense of what it would be like in any organization for guys getting gearing up for an event. Yeah, and basically that, that's really how the, the, the documentary is. It's like the first, literally first half is these guys, we just get to quote-unquote meet them. We're basically seeing them and hanging out with them as they do different things, but not really getting much uh, beyond service level or, or talking about fights. Uh, we get to meet them and see how they train a little bit here and there and, and get some more background information. But it's pretty much, literally almost at the halfway point, I want to say that then the whole movie just converges into the uh, Valley Tito Japan tournament. And this is a 100-minute movie nearly. So yeah. we essentially get, like, you know, it's about 45-ish minutes till we get to that half point, and then suddenly it's all just tournament. So, uh, you know, it's, it's like Zane like was saying, it's really just watching the tournament in the best way possible. It is. It's a great way. I mean, if they could have done this, if they could have done this for every fighter involved and, like, woven that together into watching the event, it would be fantastic. I mean, it would be well worth, like, spending the four hours or whatever that it would take to do that to actually be able to watch all the fights from this very cinematic narrative viewpoint going in. Yeah, and I guess that actually we can just go ahead and start talking about the fights now because there's no, like, like, you know, we were thinking how to review this movie. There's really no linear way to talk about this, so let's just start talking about those fights. And in this case, obviously, you're, you're hinting at uh, Yuki Nakai and Gerard Gardot. Uh, and Gerard, we know from UFC 1 as the guy that kicked Tyler Tuli in the face and made it to the finals. Um, yeah. So he, this is what happened in between. He uh, he went over to, to Valley Tour Japan. Uh, yeah, and then we is... also got Yuki Nakai, who at this point was the Shuto welterweight champion. And um, he already had, you know, at least, I think, 10 fights or, or something close to that before he even got to this event. So he was, other than Hickson, the most experienced guy in this tournament for uh, MMA-style fights. Yeah, I mean, and this is this is definitely one of those things, I think, going back and looking at it, Nikai sort of, you know, is a very obvious tournament favorite going back. You know, you look at it. Coming, you know, from an outside perspective, it's like, oh yeah, Nakai's got like ten fights. Everybody else that's actually in the tournament, like Ensign, you know, Ensign in a, in a way wasn't in the tournament. Uh, it was also only his second pro fight or something. But everybody else was incredibly raw and untutored, and Nakai was a longtime veteran. But watching it, and the sense that you very much feel from the other fighters watching it and going in. Was they didn't know anything about him? Like he was the smallest, weakest, most beatable guy there. Yes. You know. Yeah, he was very much the underdog. He was the smallest dude there. And just so you guys know, also who else was in the tournament? Uh, and this will lead us into another discussion too. 
Uh, the eight men that were in this tournament included, obviously, we had Hicks and Gracie, we had Todd Hayes, we have Kuichimo, uh, Kuichiro Kimura, who are the three guys that we followed around. And then we have Yuki Nakai, as we mentioned, Gerard Gardeau. Uh, those two guys have a lot of experience of fighting. Then on the other side of the spectrum, we have Craig Pittman, WCW pro wrestler. We have Wayne the Viking Emmons, uh, I guess just a tough man, I don't really know much about the guy. And then we had uh, Yoshishi Yamamoto, who was uh, a Rings pro wrestler. Because uh, at that time, Rings was still pro wrestling, wasn't actual MMA yet. Um, he was representing, I guess, also Satoru, uh, Satoru Sayama, a.k.a. Tiger Mask, who was the promoter for this event. So it really seems like Yamamoto actually might have been the, the favorite who was supposed to go the distance and, and actually beat Hicks and at least just give him a damn good fight. Um, but that's essentially our eight. And out of those guys, you know, really not many people had any real fight experience. In fact, uh, when we first meet uh, Koichiro Kimura, we meet his coach, Yoshinari Watanabe, uh, and he even says, you know, uh, this fighting isn't like anything we've done before. We've never had a fight like this. Where we fight, we don't punch guys in the ground. That's illegal. Uh, and he even says, I think the quote is, you know, in here, they're punching the hurt. Yeah. And that was like a foreign concept to a lot of these <laughs> Japanese wrestlers who did catch wrestling, essentially, submission fighting, but they never actually been in a real MMA-style fight. Well, they even showed Kimura doing some of his amateur uh, sort of v- valet judo or the Japanese equivalent, and you know it was very much more the open, uh, full contact karate style, where they weren't punching in the head, they weren't wearing gloves. You know, he may have been wearing like a sort of weird leotard kind of thing, but it very much looked sort of like a full contact karate tournament. That was the feel of it, and uh, that brings us to another point, too, is at this point in 1995, what the rules of MMA were. Uh, and especially in Japan, they were very different from what we were getting in the UFC. You know, UFC had uh, a lot broader rule base. Uh, here in Japan, they were mostly used to, you know, the, the most MMA they'd get was pancreas, essentially. And pancreas yeah. had open hand slaps to the face, and you could punch on the ground, but no one ever did it. Uh, it was yeah. just a gentleman's rule. Like, you, you could... I think I think there, it was a foul if you hit to the face on the ground, but you could still hit to the body if you wanted. Just very few people did it in that era. Um, so for a lot of these guys, it's like a whole new world, and and Kimura especially, no idea what he was getting into. Uh, just just most of these guys too, like just no idea what they were getting into. And uh, I guess this can kind of lead, lead us into a, a talk about Hicks and Gracie too, and that you know, was this really the best of the best that they could offer him? Yeah, I mean. Uh, that's a tough question. I, I, I mean, th- this is even, you know, this isn't even the first uh, Valley Tudo Japan that he was in or that they put together. Um, I don't know that it's quite the best they could offer him, but it certainly, I think, at the time, it, it's hard to tell, like, what kind of talent you draw at the time. I think it's still very much 94, 95, 96 are sort of the golden years of really just trying to find guys who had fought in any kind of other martial art. So, you know, you have Gordo, who had this Savate kickboxing background. You were getting pro wrestlers. You were getting, you know, these guys who were not even necessarily tough, although many of them were, but who just seemed like they had some fighting discipline, whatever it could be. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I want to try and figure out, too, is that as we're going to talk about Hickson's legacy, I feel like today, no matter what, is uh, had he fought the best of the best in his career. And looking at you know this event in particular, I mean, let's look at what the options were. Obviously, a lot of these guys were in the UFC. They weren't going to be able to go over there. They most likely had some kind of contracts. Uh, they were staying put. Um, there were no Pancrase fighters represented in this event as well. Yeah. So that makes me realize that you know Pancrase guys probably were not allowed to go in this event, even though we had guys from Rings uh, and Shuto. But those are different things because Rings and Shuto were both, you know, more pro wrestling uh, backgrounds uh, in terms of, like who was actually running the company. You know, Rings was Akira Maeda's company. Uh, I'm correcting myself from earlier because I, I was actually wrong. It's Akira Maeda who was in charge of Rings and Satoru Siyama who was in charge of Shuto. So those are two pro wrestlers. And in Japan at that time especially as well, cross-promoting was very common. Uh, you know, for example, in Japan you'd have like the Super J-Cup where you'd get wrestlers from all the different pro wrestling companies under one roof competing for, uh, you know, like all the titles. It's pretty crazy, you know, but we don't get that in America. So in Japan, it's like they had access to a bigger talent pool, but on the other hand, still things weren't as accessible. They couldn't get the Pancrase guys, it looks like. Um, we got, you know, K1 veterans, but not actually, I guess, K1 contracted fighters. And there were no UFC guys in this event um, other than Gerard Gardot, but he was not in the UFC anymore. So it seems like it's the best they could get that was accessible. And that, that's that's kind of where we are with Hickson, I guess. Yeah, it's I it's definitely I think more I mean the only real legacies to come out of these this event 
are um, this continued build of the idea of Hickson as an indomitable fighter and really the story of Yuki Nakai, which honestly, for my money, is probably the is really the story worth telling out of this. It's too bad that, you know, it, I'm sure they didn't know that going in, but he was really the fighter that should have been followed and chronicled all the way through because his his fights were by far the most compelling. But you didn't really establish a lot of other serious ideas in the MMA you know, in, in MMA history, nothing else was really built out of this. This was like an early stopping point for Ensign in a way. But other than that, you're not looking at this and going, oh, yes, this is when, you know, we got to see the first glimmers of this guy or the first, the beginning of this legacy or, I mean, even Valley of Japan only, you know, it, it sort of flickered for a few years as a major sort of showcase event and then went away for a long time. Yeah, it, it's a weird company as well. If you want to think about the history of just VTJ, like, you know, I had a few years where it ran really long, then it kind of came and went, then it just died for a while, and then most recently it actually has come back again. Uh -huh. uh, just, just bizarre. But, and uh, now they are getting, you know, the Pancrase and Shudo and all the different Japanese promotions are allowing their guys to go compete in it. Yeah, I guess maybe back in those earlier days when they first were starting, people were a little bit more afraid to actually send their guys in. They didn't want them exposed, maybe. Uh, it could be a number of things that we'll never know, but uh, I guess that also brings us up. We'll talk more about uh, the actual people in this documentary since you mentioned Nakai. Uh, yeah, I agree. It would have been amazing to have actually seen him because, again, he had the most experience. Uh, you know, He's got the best fighting style, and he's got the, probably the most interesting story, the most compelling story by the end of the documentary. Um, yeah. But you know, unfortunately, who he had is who he had, and we had Hickson, as we mentioned, uh, who basically just spends most of his time on camera waxing poetic and talking about how great jiu-jitsu is and how he, how he's in touch with energy and nature and all this other you know, poetic bullshit that he says. Uh, <laughs> except it really is. Like, a lot of it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, you know, he's trying to just be very, very deep and prolific. And it just comes off that way as him just constantly trying to be deep and prolific and not letting us pass that surface level again. Uh, yeah, I mean, I actually liked what he had to say about the actual experience of fighting and how he worked in the fight when he would talk about like this idea of being sort of on a point to watch for different options rather than just going straight for one thing or another. Um, you know, I, I liked some of that, but yeah, he had a lot of stuff about breathing properly and feeling med deep meditation and feeling in the zone. That was all a bit. Yeah. That's actually the quote you mentioned or that, or that section of, of him babbling that you mentioned it was actually one of my favorites also. Uh, but then the rest of it, it's just him trying just so hard to be important. And it almost feels that way, too. Like, again, how this documentary is just there to push Hicks and Gracie. Because even at the, that's how the documentary begins, is it's actually him being interviewed by Inside Kung Fu magazine. And we're watching him being interviewed. That's just a, a real meta kind of feeling. But it's essentially us seeing how big Hickson actually is and how important Hickson is. Uh, and then on the other side of that, we go from the prolific poet of fighting to Todd Hayes, the Texan kickboxer <laughs> who, uh, you know, he's... He's not, Most notable I, for being a bobsled, an Olympic blob, bobsledder. That's like his real claim to fame. Yes, that actually is. Yeah, Todd Hayes went on. That's, that's part of his story, actually, is how... Uh, and I actually think out of all the guys that we do get to follow, I think Todd's story is more interesting than anybody else we get to see. Yeah. Um, but he has a journey that's, again, not even really touched upon that deeply. But essentially, he's a K-1 kickboxer at this point. He's done kickboxing around, around the world. Um, but he has dreams of being an Olympic bobsledder. That's what he wants to do. And he's figuring that... This tournament, win or lose, he'll get the money he needs to buy a bobsled. If he wins his first fight, he gets one bobsled. If he wins two fights, he gets two bobsleds. That's basically how it is. He's going to get his money no matter what, and that's what he's in it for. Um, and, and moral of the story, by the way, is, folks, that he does actually get to join the Olympic team. He did in 96, uh, or 98, rather, whatever, whatever year it was. He, he did actually go on to make it into the Olympics, and uh, he had a much better career bobsledding than he did fighting. Yeah, he won uh, four bronze, or he won... He he won a silver medal at the 2002 Salt Lake City Olympic Games, so. Yeah, he's pretty. I think actually may, maybe anybody's legacy that came out of this was was Todd Hayes. He might have had the best legacy out of this entire documentary. <laughs> yeah, that 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 may be the highest, most notable sporting achievement to come out of this. It's true. Although to be fair, also our our Japanese uh, side of things, because basically it's how it was. Is you know this is the Valley Tito Japan Open World whatever tournament. So we had Hickson from Brazil, even though he's living in America. Todd Hayes, the American. And then over in Japan, we have Koichiro Kimura, as we mentioned. 
Uh, and his story, he's got no story at all, really. Like, we basically, the most we get to see of him is he goes to his parents' house, and they're busy sorting vegetables, which is kind of yep. weird. Uh, just sorting Tell through boxes of vegetables. Terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, just telling him, you know, we don't want you doing this. And he's like, oh, it'll be okay. And that's the scene. Uh, we never get to meet Kimura beyond that. I mean, this it, it's just so surface level, and it really kind of sucks, because especially a guy like Todd Hayes, he's got a deep story. He's a conflicted character. Hickson is pretty interesting. Uh, Kimura is just cardboard. He's got really nothing important to say until the very end. Uh, that's yeah. when Ishmael kind of opens up after he fights. Uh, he finally opens up to us. But beyond that, we're not getting much of, of a surface level. Uh, and that's really our main cast of characters. Um, and, and, of course, uh, Dale Cook, who is Todd Hayes' manager. He's also interesting. Uh, and that just brings you to why I think Hayes is the most interesting character, because he has the most conflict and struggle in this movie. Uh, he's the guy that he wants to do it, but not really. He just wants to get the money. And, and, you know, it's like we almost see more of the real him by the end of the documentary where he actually shows that he's, you know, hanging out on the Nagano uh, bobsled track and he's got his money now and he's all happy and smiling. And it's like the first time we actually see that he's genuinely happy and excited to talk to the camera. And that's because he's talking about what he actually wants to do. Um, yeah. And, and so I, he brings it up as well where he even says, like, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of struggling between, you know, my, my passion or money. And in the end, he, he kind of gets, uh, gets both. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I thought the probably one of the best scenes was uh, of the whole thing was him backstage discussing with his manager when exactly to pull out of the fight uh, with Hickson after he realized he broke his arm in the first bout, and he wanted to see, you know, it was like if he can get to the final, he should just go in and basically work the fight. You know, they're talking about him just go in, throw a couple punches, get taken down, tap out. You get paid, like, that's it. But if he actually had to go fight Hickson, then he should just forfeit right now because he didn't want to get hurt really badly. Yeah, that's, pr- that's pretty much it. Uh, that, that was a really good scene. Uh, I, I think the best scenes really were, were with Todd Hayes, more than Hickson or, or anybody else other than Nakai, but we don't really get to meet Nakai much. But, yeah, Hayes has a really good story. I wish his was, ex- was uh, explored a little bit more. Yeah, it's it's like I say. There's a lot of there's a lot of little like it's it's more like a movie of Easter eggs for MMA fans. I think that's really the thing. And watching Nakai fight, that's you know, I mean, that's something special because this this ended his career. This was the end of Yuki Nakai's competitive career after he got blinded in one eye in the first bout against Gerard Gordou and fought two more times beating Craig Pittman, which you don't even realize, watching that fight, it's just like, holy shit. Like, how did you survive that? Because Pittman's probably got 100 pounds on him. Easily 100 pounds. I think he's over 100 pounds. He was an enormous guy. And then fighting Hicks and Gracie, and not only fighting Hicks and Gracie, but lasting for six and a half minutes, you know? Yeah, and I guess we can can actually start talking about the fights now, and um, bringing up the Hicks and Nakai, that's the final fight in this documentary. Uh, and that was actually a cool scene, too, how, you know, as we mentioned, uh, in that first fight Nakai had against Gordo, he got blinded in, in uh, his eye. He's, uh, I think it was his right eye or left eye, whichever eye it was. He got blinded pretty bad from, from repeated gouging. He got stomped in the face also, punched in the face. Uh, and this fight left him permanently blind out of that side of his face. Um, so he had no yeah. choice but to essentially retire. But, I mean, the heart that he showed in that was, it was insane. And Hickson even knows by that point that his eye is completely closed. It's not working. He's got one eye, and Hickson doesn't want to punch him. And his family's yep. saying, no, punch him, end it quick. You can just knock him out easy a bit. And he just doesn't want to do that because that's not what he wants. Hickson wants to have a beautiful fight and not just pummel the crap out of somebody to win. It's true. It, that, was, that was very nice to see him just kind of like arguing with his brothers about whether or not to actually punch the guy or not. <laughs> his brother's just like, you'd punch me. He's your enemy. Punch him. Like... That was pretty great. Yeah, it was a cool moment because, again, we're talking about all that poetic nonsense that Hickson's constantly rattling off. Uh, and one of the things he does say, he wants to, you know, like fighting is beautiful and he wants to have beautiful fights. Uh, and even, even after he, when he fights, ya, um, I think it was Yamamoto, or I can't remember if it was, it was either Yamamoto or when he fights Kimura, uh, how he was just like, especially when he got lifted up in the air and he's about to get slammed. Yeah. Um, he was saying, like, that was just beautiful. You know, like he really liked that moment. And that's, that's what was more important to him was those moments of just beauty in the fights rather than the victory at the end. Very definitely. It was, I mean, it, it it was like I say. I I think it's more moments for MMA fans to really galvanize and be invested in than it is, um, 
for something to, you know, for, for somebody to go in and cold and be like, oh, I just want to learn about MMA and the history of MMA. This won't tell you much about the history of MMA, quite frankly. But if yeah, you no. know about the history, then it's fascinating. You will learn more about the history of MMA by watching our videos than you will by watching the Valley Tudo Japan 95 tournament. That is for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, we don't even get to see things like with the, we don't even get to see Ensign in a way fight. We don't get to see Kenji Kawaguchi fight some guy named Tommy Walking Stick, which I'm not at all sure is a real person. I think he um, actually fought a walking stick. <laughs> or, you know, we, I don't think we saw Pittman Emmons or anything like that. Um, I can't even remember the Hayes Kimura fight with any. I remember the fallout of it so much more clearly. Yeah, that's because a lot of these fights, and, and I guess we can actually talk about these fights now, uh, a lot of these fights weren't really very memorable. They were a lot like the early UFCs, and yeah. especially with this level of fighters that we had. Uh, you know, like the Hayes fight, for example, with Kimura, which is, uh, you know, they're, they're both they're, they're, it's their first fights in a tournament is against each other. Uh, it's a forgettable fight. Kimura goes for a takedown right away. Hayes, uh, I think he gets taken down the first time. They get back to their feet. Kimura does it again. Hayes sprawls this time. Uh, but Hayes has no idea what to do for most of his fights, so he just kind of starts punching Kimura's sides. Uh, eventually, Kimura keeps going for the takedown, and he doesn't use his head properly. He gets caught into a guillotine choke. That's the match. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's what we kind of saw as much strategy involved. Um, you know, I mean, even looking at Yamamoto's match against Hickson, which is a match I actually have seen in full. That one is available on YouTube. You can watch it in full there. Uh, it's a pretty dull match. It's most, yeah. It's a lot of leaning on the turnbuckle, uh, and that's what even, like, Apollo and, and uh, Todd were saying. It's like, he's just leading, he's just punched him, he's not doing anything. Uh, Yamamoto wasn't doing anything. I, I don't know if he was rope dope or if he was just not knowing what to do. Um, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of rope grabbing, and that was apparently allowed. Uh, at the yeah. Event. A lot of rope grabbing. So, yeah, these fights, for the most part, really weren't memorable. It's more so, I guess, the outcome. I mean, the only memorable fights, I'd say, really were Nakai's fights that we got to see. Uh, yeah. Because he's had such a hard struggle to, to win these fights. Yeah, Nakai's yeah Nakai's battle is really the remarkable piece of history to follow out of all of this, and the rest of it's just kind of meh in terms of fights. I mean, you're not really you get to see the great Hickson like spin around thing with when he fights Kimura that was pretty fantastic, but uh you know it was otherwise a totally one-sided fight. It was almost and, a one-sided event. Yeah. So it it is definitely one of those things where I think it's a it's a great way to look at an event that otherwise is not all that interesting. You know? It's a great lens with which to view a bunch of fights that if you just wa sat and watched them all cold, you'd be like, "Oh man, I am not this is not easy to get through." I could definitely agree, and um, I mean, maybe we can actually talk now about the structure and the actual production of the doc itself, now that we talked about a lot of the content. Uh, those fight scenes were boring to watch, for the most part. Like, you know, it's to begin with, there's no commentary in the Japanese tracks for these. Like, I know there's no commentary. I, I'm pretty sure there's no commentary. That is. Yeah. Um, so we have no commentary. We just have the natural background noise. We're just getting, you know, occasionally we get cuts to guys backstage, Um but I mean, I don't know if that was the right way to actually handle these fights because they're just they're pretty dull to watch and they were not that exciting to watch uh, as well seeing in this format. And I don't know if it's just because you know a these fights were boring or just not very good or just because you know maybe we're, we're being a little more picky because we're fans of the sport. I mean, if if we were not fans of the sport, would those fight scenes have actually kept our attention? That's that's kind of a question I want to know. Yeah, and I I think I I think the Nikai and Hickson, um, you know, I I think that. Though those would have, because they did a good job really highlighting the intense moments of, or at least the the kicks and Kimura fight, and then the Hicks and Nakai, and just the Nakai Gordu fights. Those those were reasonably well highlighted, but I don't think anything else would capture anybody's imagination. I mean, they barely captured my imag. I I can't even remember them or picture them all that well, you know. So it's pretty much the fights with the more experienced guys were the better fights to watch, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and that just says a lot about the tournament itself. There was just a lot of guys who just didn't know what they were doing. It's true. But in terms of production, um, I actually kind of enjoyed the inner cut narrative thing. It gave a nice sense of build to the event. Like you're cutting back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then suddenly you're here at the event, 
and then you're following the people as the event progresses. Yeah, I mean, I've always said like the you know the background stuff is the more interesting stuff when it comes to the fights. The fights are what they are, and it's cool to see them. But I want to know what happens to the fighters before the fights and after the fights because that's the most telling. You know, like when you actually get to see who's nervous, who's puking backstage, who's ready to go. Uh, and like Nakai, for example, he's all like, you know, he's he's all fucked up one side of his face. He's like, Hickson, I'm coming for you next. And then we got Todd Hayes, who just is like pacing. Uh, yeah. Kamura, just no idea what to do. Kamura's just stone faced because I, I think he's just so nervous. He doesn't know how to even react. And then after he loses the second time. Uh, he's just crying in front of the cameras. That's like, finally, we got a moment of truth with this, with this guy. Uh, and then Hickson, who's just hanging out, relaxing. For Hickson, it's just another day. You know, it's just a, uh, you know, yeah. just a day or whatever it is. It's no big deal for him. Uh, yeah, his, his, he, his whole th- setup seemed very much the most professional. You know, he's eating a banana, he's drinking some water, getting the rub down. Very ready to go through the whole process. I think that's also because Hickson got, uh, if, I'm sure you noticed this too, like, Hickson got a lot of leeway in this event. Like, they were like, yeah. how much time do you need, Hickson? 20. Okay, I'm going to be 25. Like, you know, he'd, he'd basically he'd run to the bathroom right before his fight was about to happen. They had to delay it five more minutes. Or, you know, Hickson kind of got the run of the show, if you really if you really look at it that way. Yeah, very much. Yeah, I, I think the events were really made to highlight him. Like I say, he was in, you know, the, the first one, he won that. I think coming back, they, um, they you know, it, it was his show to kind of get to get to do what he wanted and be the star. He was the star for Valley Tudo Japan. And that's probably why it was focused on him, the documentary, so much so. But it is too bad just because, like I say, the, the most interesting thing to come out of it was really the Yuki Nakai story, and you really only see the smallest glimpses of that. And it's unfortunate that Nakai's, you know, basically cut short after this in terms of his career and, and what else. I mean, obviously, he went on to do big things after he started the Pariester Gym. Uh, I believe he was the first Japanese guy to get a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as well. Um, so he's got a really big story afterwards. But yeah, I mean, it does kind of bring you to the point of how did uh, Goodman choose who he followed and who let him do this? Because he had production teams in Japan. He had a team, I guess, in Brazil as well. Um, so he had multiple people working. And obviously they, they had the crew of the Valley Theater of Japan giving him all that footage backstage. But you know, it makes you kind of wonder, why did he choose these people of, of all to follow? Like I figure, you know, if you're in America, for example, you could have had Craig Pittman, you could have had Wayne Emmons. But he chose Todd Hayes, and that's because I guess Todd had a good story. He chose Hickson because Hickson's got a good story. And then on the Japanese side, we had Yamamoto, Nakai, Kimura, uh, and that could have just been a case of access. Kimura might have been the guy that was, you know, most available to actually shoot some footage. Yeah, that's probably what it was. Uh, we got what we got. That's much the best we can say, and that's kind of what we can say about Hickson's career too. Is he got what he got, and he made the best of it. Uh, and we're, unfortunately, we're not going to really be talking much about Hickson until we, we ever get to Pride Fighting Championships, because uh, you know after this, that's basically what he went on to do. Is he did I think uh, was he in the '96 tournament? I don't know if he was or was no, he not. Was not in the '96 yeah. tournament. After the after Valetudo Japan '95, he fought twice for Pride and then once for C2K Coliseum. Yeah. Coliseum fights for against Funaki. Ben- Funaki. Yeah. Yeah. So. so he didn't do much, and I mean. You know, for most Americans, this was essentially, uh, other than the Gracie in action tapes, this was their first chance to see the illustrious and fabled Hickson as I punch my camera. Uh, you know, this was their first chance to really get to meet Hickson and uh, get to see what he's all about. So I guess in that regard, was it successful in that, uh, you know, the hype for Hickson was built up? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, no. Well, it's not successful at all, no. Thinking about it, because, I mean, the whole idea is, like I say, this doesn't teach you anything if you don't come in knowing everything. What this does is it shows you the things that you've already read, that you've already heard about, that you've already gotten to know about the event and about the people in it. So if you already thought that Hickson was a badass, then it's sort of like, oh man, I get to watch him in action, I get to see the build up, I get to see everything surrounding his fights. It builds that legend that you've already have. And if you you know about Nikai, you get to see Nikai fight. You get to see this amazing sort of string of victories and this or these two victories and this loss he went through. And you know you, you get that build up of the interest. But if you just come in cold and like are expecting to come out with some message out of it, I mean, you know the 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 eventual event and Hickson's victory at the end, you don't think. You know, you see Nakai, and you don't think, oh, Hickson just dominated, you know, he just dominated the best competitor out there. You think 
he just beat the piss out of this guy who overcome incredible overcame incredible odds. Because nobody's talking about Nakai throughout the video, like, oh, he was the favorite and he was going to win. It was always like, oh, look at that little guy. Pittman's going to crush him. You know, like, that was the narrative going into his fight with Pittman. So, no, I don't think it built Hickson on its own, I would say. Oh, I can't hear you. I appear to have lost your mic. No. No. There you go. You're here. All right, let me try plugging me back in my microphone. That was weird. Let's see what happens now. I gotcha. Did you lose oh. me again? No. Okay, cool. That was weird. All right, well, sorry about that, folks. So you were saying, as I lost my mic. <laughs> so yeah, I was saying that I don't think this really does anything in terms of, like, independently, this doesn't develop Hicks and Gracie as a great fighter. But if you already know, Oh, if Hicks and Gracie is a great fighter, this does re help reinforce that idea. Yeah, I would agree. As I said before, this is kind of like a snapshot of MMA in 1995. Uh, so I'm going to move my mic for a second. So yeah, it's basically a snapshot of mixed martial arts in 1995. We're not learning anything we didn't already know. Uh, and as an outsider watching this event, let's say like someone who wasn't an MMA fan, I don't know if it would even matter that much. I mean, at this point, Hickson's legacy was not that well known. By 99, it was, his guess was a little bit bigger, but still, it was mostly in, in the circle of MMA. Um, it's not really a film about his legacy, per se, but, you know, for us fight fans who, uh, a lot of us still to this day question Hickson's abilities and his legacy, uh, and, and what his wins were, you know, who, who they were against, so I think the most we can really say is at the time he fought the best that was available, and he did what he could to them, and that was pretty much, you know, destroy them, because most of them had no idea what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, had he continued to fight a little bit later on, had he fought, fought more credible opponents, then maybe, you know, we would actually, you know, we, we'd talk the same way about Fedor to, to in regards to Hickson. But, uh, you know, Fedor actually fought the best of the best, whereas Hickson, he fought the best pro wrestlers of Japan. That seems to be the yeah. biggest fight he had. I mean, I, I would say I think the thing with Hickson is he won at a time when winning was the only real important mark of ability. 400 to 0. Yeah. <laughs> 400 to 0, yes, that too. But no, I mean, like, at this point in the history of MMA, when, you know, 95, 94, 95, 96, that era... There's no like the the best fighters were the guys who won, no matter who they were fighting. That's really the only mark of success that you can really put on people, you know. Yeah, it's pretty much if you won and ultimately how you did it. Cause, you know, especially when you watch those old UFCs as we have, uh, the process doesn't really matter as often as it does getting the finish. Because the better guys were yeah. the ones that got the finishes, and that's just how it always is. Uh, but more so in that era, it was you know. The guys that got the finishes were the ones that were the best. They were the ones that became the stars. Uh, and especially in Japan, it's the same kind of logic. Um, so, yeah, Hickson's legacy, meh. That's that's kind of our uh, our opinion on that, I suppose. It, I, I would say that he was he was very good for the... Lim he, he was le totally legit for the very limited spectrum in which he competed. Yes, I would agree with that sentiment as well. I think that's, that's the best way to put it right there is, you know... I guess the layman's ways of saying he is what he is, and we got what we got out of Hickson at the time. And it's unfortunate he never really, you know, he stopped fighting after that fight with Funaki. I wish he had kept going, fought some more. I definitely would have helped him a lot to have fought some some bigger names, but you know, we got what we got. Yeah, it was a rough time for fighting big names. I mean, big name, you know, unless he wanted to go into the UFC, and the UFC wasn't paying. You know, like the the UFC built a lot of what we considered to be names and pancreas. With the other, those were the organizations at the time that were building what we would consider to be names, classically and historically in MMA. And if he didn't want to fight for the UFC or Pancras, then you know he wasn't going to fight. There was nobody outside of those two organizations really built a name for themselves. 
I mean, even a guy like Eric Paulson, you know, he's pretty much in that same Hickson era as like an early Shudo champion. Yeah, and it's funny how Eric Paulson, you know, when you consider him the best in the world, you know, Eric Paulson is known a lot better, it seems like, as a coach than he was as a fighter, which is weird because he had a, an amazing career in Japan and yeah. just kind of forgotten about. We have Hickson, you know, Hickson's all like, yay, 400 and 0, but then you got Paulson, who's actually like, proven as one of the best, or Matt Hume as well. You know, Matt Hume was one of those early, very, very early pioneers of mixed martial arts in Japan. Um, yeah, I wish those guys got talked about a lot more than Hickson. It, it's, it's as weird as that might sound. Uh, they deserve as much respect as Hickson gets. Well, they're more important to the legacy of MMA ultimately. Hickson is an interest. He's a great fighter, but he's an interesting footnote as a great fighter. You know, I mean, he's he's it classically in the history of MMA. Hickson Gracie, much unfortunately, and I, it pains me to say this because it's very much true of Hoist as well. They're more trivia than they are important figures. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Like what you know what is what what is Hoist's lasting gift to MMA? You know, who are the great Hoist Gracie trained fighters today? What are his, you know, what what is, what's your great Hoist Gracie single fight highlight? You know, like... I would say when he uh, tapped out Art Jimerson. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's honestly the most memorable Hoist Gracie fight. It really is. Yeah, I'm you trying know. to think of anything else, but I mean, realistically, I mean, he uh, Jason DeLucia wasn't really that great of a fight... Uh, yeah, nice his, mission, I mean, but, yeah. his biggest win is Ken Shamrock coming in when nobody knew who Ken Shamrock was, and he was just barely starting to establish his reputation in Pancrase as a legit fighter. Yeah, and then, and then just scraping by in the rematch and just getting a draw yeah. in the end. Yeah. So, hit you know, for a lot of these great, a lot of the you know, for Hickson and Hoist both, I think ultimately their legacy ends up being more footnote than sort of um, legendary, or you know, it. I mean, even legend is fine, but like more than like somebody who really impacted the sport over decades. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there with that uh, summation of, of Hickson. And uh, I'm sure some commenters might agree or disagree, but uh, I think uh, I, I can pretty much agree with that myself. Um, so I guess as, as we move ahead and wrap up this discussion about Choke, uh, I think one note I do want to talk about too is how this movie was shot in 1995 but never actually got distribution until nearly four years later. Um, and it's interesting because, I mean, does it actually make the documentary feel more dated or does it even matter? Because in 99, you know, we were basically in the dark ages of MMA full on, but also popularity of it was starting to rise a little bit more, starting to peak. And, and I don't even think I heard about this documentary really until, like, probably 2000 anyway. So, uh... It doesn't you know. matter, ultimately. I mean, like, I wouldn't remember that it was 99 and not 95. I mean, it's shot... It, it's... The release... Like, at the time of that pop... That era of popularity of MMA, you're basically running all word of mouth anyway. So it's not, like, any distribution it could have gotten. It wouldn't be, like in theaters documentary about Valley Tudo Japan 95, you know, there would be no, it, it would, it, it's like, oh, I just watched, Shep, you know, Valley Tudo 95, now I'm going to watch the documentary about it. Like, that would never, you know, at the time have happened. Yeah, I, I just find it in interesting to note that, that, you know, basically it did, it did take four years to get distribution because, uh, you know, if you look at it again from a historical standpoint, 95 when this was shot, MMA was, just starting to be heard as a word, or rather it was no holds barred fighting, or there barely yeah. was even a word for it yet. It really wasn't even a word for it yet still. But by 99, it was much more of a thing. Uh, and maybe it was a little bit more popular by then, So, and, and as well as controversial. So, you know, it's just an interesting note to think about the timeline of, of what it took to get this thing out there and to get recognition. And even then, like, you know, I think to this day, it's had a very limited recognition factor, um, which is unfortunate, because it is a pretty good documentary overall. Oh, um, yeah. It just kind of fell behind, because then, you know, if you think about it, too, it's come out in 99, then Choke came out, like, what, two years later? Not, not two years, but a few years later, Choke came out. And, uh, not yeah. Choke, sorry. A few years later, Smashing Machine came out, oh. and that just blew it out of the water. And hopefully we're going to talk yeah. about Smashing Machine uh, in, in our next break between milestones. I think that's probably a good thing to watch as well in our next break. But, um, you know, if you think about the timeline when these two things came out, uh, Choke just kind of gets forgotten, and it really does. There's a lot of other documentaries that are, I hate to say it, but just more well put together. Uh, yeah, but for I time, mean, it's an easy hour and a half. Like you're not, you don't get bored. You're not sitting there going, "How long is this?" You know, I I looked at like the, you know, the pauses at some point halfway or in the midst of it, and I was like, "Oh, I'm already an hour in." Geez, that felt quick. 
you know? Yeah. It's not, yeah, it's, it's not unentertaining. No, it's definitely not unentertaining. It's just it's kind of gotten forgotten about, I feel like, these days, uh, especially with, you know, here we are in 2014, and now it's, you know, it's common to see, you know, multiple MMA-related or fight-related documentaries come out every year. You know, we just had Fight Church come out. Uh, we've had Buffalo Girls, I think, a few years before that. We had Warrior, the uh, the first big Hollywood MMA movie production. And, you know, back in 99, this was a new thing. So, you know, in a way, as well as UFC was a pioneer and those early Ballad to Japan shows are pioneers, Choke is kind of like our, our pioneer of MMA documentaries. Mm, very much so. Well, I think, I don't know if I have a whole lot of other big things to say about it. I feel like... We've covered it top yeah, so to that, bottom. That's pretty much choking me. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about, Zane? No, no. So I, I guess think... overall, if we were to give this thing a rating, so, uh, how, how many thumbs up would you give it? I, I, I would give it uh, three and a half thumbs up out of five. Okay, that's a pretty good rating. I think I would just give it a, a three out of five. Okay. Um, yeah, but overall, I mean, it's still very watchable. Uh, I, you know, I think uh, in terms of actual like being being put together, you know, it's very much on the fly kind of documentary. There's not really very much setups. It, it almost feels like a news piece more than it does like you'd see documentaries today. Um, that's just kind of the shooting style that we got in that in that time period as well for docs. Um, it's not really a very daring documentary. It doesn't really explore much. It just gives us a very surface level look at fighting um, and shows us humans behind it. But I don't think it really gets as deep as it could. Uh, to humanize those guys a little bit more. Like I said, you know, with Todd Hayes, or especially with Kimura, even with Hickson, you know, we just kind of hit surface level. Uh, yeah. And that's just kind of how I feel about this doc, because it's just a surface level MMA doc that's a footnote to a, a period of time in the sport. Pretty much, unfortunately. But fun to watch. Yeah, so we definitely say watch it. It's definitely worth watching. You can check it out. Uh, it actually is on YouTube at this point. You can still probably dig it up on YouTube if you want to watch it as well. And it's worth checking out. It's you know, 90, 98 minutes of your time that you won't get back, but it'll be well spent. <laughs> Indeed. So I think uh, that comes to a close of our, our choke discussion. And uh, we welcome all comments in Twitter and on YouTube and bloodyelbow.com, of course. And uh, we also recommend that if you have not voted yet in our Old School MMA Awards, please do that. There will be links to follow where you can go vote and get your voices heard. So next time you see us, we're going to do our proper OS MMA award show, and then we're getting back to UFCs. We're going to hit up UFC 12, where uh, we get our first double weight class tournament. Ooh, yeah. excitement. Very much excitement. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the awards, to the voting. I'm not going to vote, but I'm looking forward to hearing about other people voting. I've, decided, to to so much. I I've decided that, that ritual suicide is my only option, but... Uh, yeah. yeah there are hotlines to prevent ritual suicides. <laughs> All right. 1 800 Seppuku. <laughs> I think we're done here. Yeah. All right. Take us out, Zane. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, you know, remember to follow us on Twitter. Uh, maybe like this video on Facebook. I know, you know, you don't like to hear be pitched at, but it honestly is about the only sense of self-worth I get anymore. So do that, um, and if you're going to talk about us, make sure it's at least slightly behind our backs. And uh, until next time, I got nothing. I, too, have nothing. We will see you guys next time for the OSMMA Award Show. Toodles. See you crest out.